Hello and welcome to Bar Napkin Business, episode number five. Today we are talking to John Camp about commercial real estate and the grit it takes to succeed as an entrepreneur. Hello and welcome to Bar Napkin Business. I'm Matt. I'm Allie. And today we meet with John Camp to talk commercial real estate and going from a paper boy to owning a large portion of the hay market. We had tossed around the word czar, but we haven't talked about that with him, so we're not sure if he's okay with that, but that's kind of what it seems like. Uh, we both actually lease from uh, John. He is our landlord. It was fun to hear him talk about when they first got into it and had 90% in vacancies, 18% mm -hmm. interest rates. I mean, that's really gut check time. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if you're in it long enough, everybody's gonna go through one of these periods where it's terrifying and the math doesn't work and right. you just put your head through the wall and, and, <laughs> and, and get through it. Um, that's really interesting to hear. You know, he's been in it almost four decades now. Mm -hmm. um, so he's seen booms and busts and the markets do what they do and it's not what you're doing when the market's doing what it's doing, mm -hmm. it's, it's how you react to it. Mm -hmm. So I, I found that really interesting for John. Yep, so we get a chance to uh, talk through that with John and ask him questions like, can we get cheaper rent? <laughs> we'll see how he answers that. But uh, let's go ahead and roll to the interview. We hope you enjoy this with John Camp. Joining us today on Bar Napkin Business is John Camp, uh, owner and developer of Haymarket Square. Uh, he's been in this real estate, commercial real estate game for a few decades now, and uh, we're excited to get into it. So first of all, thank you very much, John, for yeah, joining thanks. us. Well, Matt and Allie, thanks for inviting me. I'm excited here to share with you and uh, others who will view this uh, different little things that I've encountered, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. So let's go to it. Yeah, Side note, awesome. he is our landlord, both oh. of our landlords. So uh, there might be some uh, fun questions we can get him on here. Oh, I get the thing. <laughs> I know. Not yet, though. Okay. First of all, how did it all start? When did it start? started in actually about 1981 the concept came out I had a actual consulting firm headquartered in Kansas but I had the Lincoln office here and owned half the firm and I had just finished up a three-year lease in an office and I thought you know I'd like to find an old home in Lincoln and so ended up talking to one of my clients who was a dentist who practiced out of an old two-story home and I said gee Larry do you know of any other homes for sale long story short he owned the four vacant decrepit buildings here around the courtyard at Haymarket Square, and he said, gee, he and his wife Dorothy had bought it years earlier. They thought they were going to develop it. Yeah, just false starts. They wanted out. So I came down on a Friday and looked at them, and actually, uh, as I've shared before, the Veith building here in which the tavern on the square is located was, I said, great. I said, gee, Larry, I'll buy that. And he said, no, no, we want to get rid of all of them. So I worked ahead for, gosh, six to nine months trying to get other investors interested in this concept. Because again, I was being a lawyer by background, doing all my tax planning. I had an office in Dallas, and I was all over the place. I had a little airplane at the time. So tried to get investors together, and I found that to be a little hard. Because the Haymarket District at that time in 1981-82 was just after Russell Stover's Candies moved out of these buildings and consolidated in Kansas City. And they used either for manufacturing of candies, production of candies, I guess you'd say, or they used for storage. So they taken all of them, but then they moved out, closed down, consolidated. All four of these? Yeah, all four of these, and um, oh, there, well, and there was also even a, a pet shop that had some parakeets up on oh. third floor of the Harpham. So okay. we inherited an interesting collection. <laughs> but uh, bottom line, uh, my former wife and I got together, and we ended up getting another couple to go in with us. Everybody else was just shy. You know, I, I talked to good people. Too risky, or? Yeah, it, there had been some false starts in the, in the Haymarket area. Okay. And the original name of the area people called Haymarket Square. And so even the city was a little hesitant to do much. The bankers, I'd worked at a bank for a while after law school, and they said, eh, we don't know about this. And so we just. So Russell to, Stover's had exited. Yes. Was there tenants in any of the buildings? I mean, what, what was the occupancy rate? Um, it, was, it was really pretty much empty in this whole four or five square block area. You had a, they had been in a warehouse district around the turn of the century. That's sort of the history, and so different. Mm -hmm. uh, wholesalers like a food wholesaler and so forth. Uh, but Russell Stovers had just come to take over it. The Salvation Army had been down here and they ultimately moved out. You had the old mission, the city mission. Mm -hmm. 
uh, a sidetrack bar and the train depot. <laughs> and across the street, oddly enough, which is now the new graduate hotel, at that time was the Hilton Hotel. Oh, wow. And so it, it was interesting. But other than that, it was just kind of had the wind sucked out. Okay. So walk us through the steps. We, you know, you said, OK, we're going to do this crazy thing. We're going to buy all four buildings. What did you do first? Obviously, money is a thing. What were the first three, four steps? OK, well, as I said, uh, before I even made the offer to purchase, I had to get some other investors. It was just bigger than what we felt we could take on our own. And it wasn't going to be a primary uh, profession for me. I was going to still do my other trotting around the country on actuarial consulting. So that's where we tried to entice or interest other investors to join us, get a seed money there. And what were you looking for? So this is 81, 82. Right. What, what kind of money are you looking for? Are you going to ask for? We, we were trying, we figured at that time to do this, we needed at least a million dollars together or maybe a combination of capital investment by angel investors or whomever and then uh, borrow at the bank. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to invest a lot of equity, especially here where it was empty buildings and all the banks especially said, you know, we want to see a lot of your sure. skin yeah, in the game. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So, and that's where we worked. And as I said earlier, it was a difficult time because people just said, there's too much risk there. We want to wait and see what happens. You know. So nobody wants to be the first one to do anything, right? On this particular thing, yes. And I think, you know, for a lot of young entrepreneurs today too, it, it's, it's kind of a challenge there. You go through some of those steps. Uh, in fact, uh, in my own actuarial business, we found we were all headquartered in Kansas. And finally, we said, well, no, we need some offices. So we'd just rent a little tiny office or something and stick someone there. So you start out there, or you might have a home-based person. And again, today, we often see young entrepreneurs, that, uh, or even big entrepreneurs like Apple founders and others start out in a garage or something, and it just moves out. Or Speedway Motors start out in a garage. and. So some of those things, there is a progression. You, you kind of start small, make sure you get your concept out there. Mm -hmm. Both of you have been there yourselves, and, and you keep then looking at it and try to grow. So thinking of your steps, Matt, what I would say is you, you need to get some, the finances in order. You have to have a business plan that others believe in. In our case, we ended up pretty much doing a lot of ourselves. Uh, we put a lot of equity into it, fortunately, to start. And what, what did that look like for you? Did you floor every mm -hmm. bank account? Was it all your money into it? Did you have some aside? Were you leveraged mm -hmm. to the gills? What, what did it look like for well, you? Well, I was in a fortunate position that my, my regular job, I was doing very, very, very well. And, but every paycheck would go straight to uh, pay contractors. Mm -hmm. We ultimately got uh, went to a couple stages of financing. Uh, the county, Lancaster County, ended up with state authority to do some uh, revenue bonds. And so they did something there and National Bank of Commerce, which is now Wells Fargo, said, well, we'll take a gamble here. And they bought it for their own portfolio. You know, normally the banks will farm out the financing. Right. Mm -hmm. They right. bought it and all and took a, uh, just took a chance on us. And mm -hmm. now I have to tell you too, and maybe one of the things I would say to your viewers is there's an entrepreneurial spirit there, uh, and that perseverance, that passion. In fact, the other day I was viewing an old TED speech, mm -hmm. and the uh, commentator there had done some research, and she came up with a summary of what makes people successful. Mm -hmm. And so this is nothing new, but she came up with the word grit. You know, mm -hmm. if she said I, she found that it wasn't necessarily IQ, it wasn't whether you're top of your class, it wasn't always where, where you grew up. I call it stomach. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I call it. Yeah. You yeah. call it stomach. Yeah, yeah, that grit. And you know, I thought about it, and I actually the 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 YouTube video was sent to me by some friends in China that have known me for 20 years. And they said, John, this is you. You have grit. Yeah, and I, I'd never thought, I always talk about passion. I get passionate about something. And that's another part of it I think that, that helps is that passion. You gotta believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad gave me a talk one time when I was in high school. And he said, John, which, to, to be successful in life, he said, don't think about the finances, but to be successful is define your passion and it, use your God-given talents. And he said, if you do that and stick to it, mm -hmm. maybe you should have said the word grit. Mm -hmm. You just, they're there, and if you get some setbacks, well, those are opportunities to reinvigorate and get out there and do it. it makes you better at your craft. Yeah. Right. yeah, and right. in the 80s, let me tell you about this. We finally, we bought the property, we paid cash for that out of our equity, and we started construction, but the bills started coming in, so that, it got a little So tender. what are you doing for build-out? Was it a massive rebondal when you get in? Yeah, mm -hmm. we came in, and everything, like the courtyard out here in Haymarket Square was a junk pile. Mm -hmm. We totally tore that out, did that. We figured that was gonna be our focal point of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, an old bar called Stooges, where old Chicago is at the time, which was really 
had a lot of problems, so we wanted to, with the courtyard, had to make sure that was safe, and now it's great. But uh, so you know, we just had to go in plumbing and everything. The city finally came in and did some redo of the sanitary lines, the storm sewers, water mains, because these were all 100 years old. Yeah. So it was just, you have to have that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And also, so it was a complete job. Our buildings, we pretty much gutted, tried to save whatever historical features, like we've got an old door here behind you yeah, that yeah, sure. was a connection yeah. between these buildings and so forth. Mm -hmm. But in starting it, it's just, we kept redoubling. From 1982 to 1985, if you can imagine this, and a lot of young entrepreneurs are too young, but we were paying 18% interest. Oh my goodness. I mean, you, you talk about today, two or three percent, 18 percent interest at the mm -hmm. bank. Also, we started out, and quite frankly, I, I used to do, at that time, a lot of work in Colorado and down in Dallas, and I, I liked historical buildings. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, we'll fix it up, and they will come, and everyone's going to like it. <laughs> well, how'd it go? <laughs> yeah, how'd it go? <laughs> it was tough. From 82 to 85, we had 90% vacancy. Oh, my goodness. So you imagine, and we had... So then where you're at, you're in 36 months, 48 months, something right. like that. Are you mm -hmm. scared now? I mean, now, oh, now you're coming we, out of pocket every month, yeah. every, you know, it, it's... It was, we got a little financing, and I mean, we, we pledged ourselves, our kids, our 10th generation, <laughs> you know, at the bank, everything. Uh, and, but it was just, there is no such word as failure in our vocabulary. It was a, a renewed challenge and an opportunity. We just got to stick to it, use that mm -hmm. grit. And uh, one of the things, the breaking point, the third thing we had, again, I said, the 90% vacancy, the 18% interest, and we had three off-street parking spots. Oh my goodness. And yeah. I, I realize it's not necessarily in the real estate business, location, location, location. Mm -hmm. It's parking, parking, parking. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. even that way today. Yeah. You know, and we yeah. have a lot more than three. So. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, exactly. So what happened in 1985, a warehouse across the alley here from Haymarket Square came up for sale. And mm -hmm. so I purchased that and we just used it for parking. Mm -hmm. And instantly I leased a whole building. So, Interesting. And so ever since, and yeah. as you two have experienced. So was what year? That was 1985. So that okay. was your tipping point. Yeah, that, that really helped. And in a, a year or so earlier, the candy factory came and started, so we saw some others coming in. Mm -hmm. Now, we also saw some come in that ultimately went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And we just said, we're not going to go there. there. Again, failure wasn't in our vocabulary. So were the people that you were starting this venture with, did they have as much grit as you did? Or were uh, you kind of They were the sort of passive, great partners. Uh, I've since bought them out, but they they just uh, and they were minority partners but mm -hmm. good people and uh, the husband's uh, parents had died and he inherited mm -hmm. some money he said well we'll roll the dice with John <laughs> so, uh -huh. so I, I, I had people and I, you know I haven't said that yet but people believers in you and I've been very fortunate in my life through a number of situations that I've had people who believe in me and what I've done and, and those close to me so it was a team effort and that really meant a lot to, to have that. Yeah. So real estate's obviously a long game, right? It's yeah. it's you're not you're not trying to buy these buildings and sell them in the next year. You know, like, it's it's a forever, right? Or a long time. Yeah. Um, so since then you've grown significantly. You own several other buildings. I mean, shoot, I think you own half the Haymarket. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're too kind. But why commercial real estate instead of residential? Can you discuss through the pros and cons? I'm sure you've looked down mm -hmm. that path. Well, you know, that's a great question because uh, we started out looking, uh, we wanted some anchor tenants and offices and all, and then we thought, well, maybe we ought to put some residential units in uh, a little early in the market, but some friends of mine who did residential mm -hmm. said, John, you know, there, there's a little bit of a difference between residential and commercial. They're just two different beasts. You have different laws to uh, follow mm -hmm. and types of leases and so forth. And they said, you know, you might want to think of staying there. So what I did do is I focused on single office tenants. You know, we had all this mm -hmm. vacancy, and so, like I did in Dallas, I, I rented a closet literally for my office there, <laughs> and uh, it rates much higher than what I lease nice offices for today. You, you, I would love to charge you yeah. what I paid in <laughs> Dallas, go. Allie. Uh, okay. My okay. <laughs> so, but um, no, the uh, uh, I had to take some very un. Uh, I was almost going to say abnormal, different approaches to the real estate. Again, that wasn't my training, too, to be honest with you. I just thought, you know, we'll fix it up, lease it up, and it'll just take care of itself. Well, that was the executive suite movement of single offices wasn't here yet. No, it wasn't. Right. And, and so, in a way, that's what we used, but it helped fill the space. But what we have done over the years is we still have a number of small to medium-sized tenants, even single offices, and then we worked on the parking. We ultimately now, as you were suggesting or indicating, Matt, we expanded. 
And so around the late 1980, 1980s, <laughs> 1990, we expanded. We bought what is now the Apothecary Building and really more than doubled there. And we just thought, you know, we're, we're going to go there. We've got the base here and uh, had a game plan. We bought parking with it. We knew in the, next to the Apothecary in the Ridnour Building, we could build an underground garage. Mm -hmm. So parking was king. And so as we went, we did that. And that was a key to my formula on the office type tenants. Uh, we. So that, that's how we've done it. Stayed pretty much in the commercial side. It, it is a little bit of a different beast. And mm -hmm. You kind of just, touch, well, obviously commercials are longer, longer leases. That's attractive. You can get a couple more bucks out of them than you can a residential, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But you, you just touched on that of changing gears. Um, you know, so the, on the front end, it's terrifying, right? Mm -hmm. it, we, we, bought, we bought all this. We're, we got a bunch of debt. Uh, we're 90% vacancy. And then it, it, it kind of leveled out. You did some stuff. When was the change gears moment? Was it the next building? Was it did you did you leverage yourself farther? I mean, what did, what did that look like when you? Or was there a big remodel on a building that you needed to do that that another gut check time in, in five or six years after the first time entering? I think there were a couple of stages. I think that uh, after 1985, the late 1980s, because we saw some more interest in the area, people said, you know, this really is going to go. Yeah. The farmers market came down here, which was something we in brought over from 13th Street mm -hmm. and so we got more family activities and you had this interest too I think not just Lincoln but nationally right. in the character of older buildings the brick walls mm -hmm. and so forth just something unique not a sterile walled office mm -hmm. so to speak and so a lot of activities in 1985 I and a couple other uh, building owners set up a nonprofit entity to help organize the area and one of the functions we did or one of the approaches we did was work with the National Trust for Historic Preservation and they had a subsidiary called the Main Street Center mm -hmm. and it would go around primarily smaller towns where they had the typical town home, town square and help them redevelop it and get it together. So mm -hmm. Lincoln applied and we didn't really make the cut but then they said you know you're kind of unique you're a warehouse district if you'd like to we'll work with you. So we worked with them and set up this corporation which now it owns the Hardy Building, the Granger Buildings because we wanted to help get some affordable housing here mm -hmm. so we, but we started that in 1985 and for about five years, they came in on a consulting basis and we hired an individual to help us there, coordinate some things, looking at the design of the area, the, uh, the pr promotion. In fact, they said what you need to do is set up something like a gateway mall or mm -hmm. the mall management, but you do it for these old buildings. So we got the identity and everything. So that, that helped too, because it gave us some outside expertise mm -hmm. that in that era was something we needed. At what point did you become the Haymarket developers? I mean, that was 1982. We, okay. we set up, we got the name Haymarket Square, so we trademarked right. that, so we own that. We thought it was important. And one of my partners said, you know, let, call it Haymarket Square. And so it was a great idea because, and that was part of the uh, Main Street Center too, is get your identity. And what you want to do is just like a, a Gateway Mall, a South Point, you want to say, people know what Haymarket is and it took several years to Call get it what this it is, right? yeah right. and then so you get people coming to the Haymarket and from there you may go down to the buildings we thought unique building names so well, we called ours Haymarket Square you got the candy factory you got the apothecary which used to be the Lincoln Drug Company and right. some others like that so get people to understand and you work them down then to to be to get the identity and what's really exciting uh, and I'm thinking back on what you said, Matt, it's been, a, it's been an evolution and it's, it's almost a curve that's just, just geometrically growing. It's amazing because I thought by 1990 we had grown, but heavens, with mm -hmm. the, what's developed in the West Hay market, which is not the, it's the new rather than the old, but and with Pinnacle Bank Arena and all the attractions, the lead Center, hotels. So now you're a seasoned vet. You know, <laughs> now you've been in it for a while. Uh, what's the most difficult part of your job? Is it handling upkeep, is it finding new tenants, finances, staffing, time management? What, what is the thing in your job that is difficult today as you've grown? Well, no particular order. You mentioned time management at the last. I am, uh, uh, it's very difficult for me to say no. Uh, in fact, my family gave me these two oak letters, say no, and I got them up on my <laughs> desk. And it's just, I, I'm a glutton, I just accept things. And so time management for me, uh, is, is difficult because I also wear the hat on the city council. I'm in my 19th year now, mm -hmm. and I, I believe in giving back the community. So that and that's a whole nother subject. So I do that plus the management here of Haymarket. And now we are, we're in the phase you constantly need to keep improving, keep maintaining the newness. Uh, individuals like you, Allie, mm -hmm. for example, the, the totally new entrepreneurial theme here, which is great. I, I cultivate it. And I want more and more 
entrepreneurial businesses because you get that synergism and you've got your passion mm -hmm. and that excitement. You know, keep energy. the yeah that yeah. yeah it just yeah that energy level that's here that I don't think is in a lot of other areas and we keep that. But there are changes mm -hmm. and the the business plans, the whole approach is going in a different fashion. Communications equipment, you know, whether mm -hmm. you, you know the old telephone. With gosh, everyone carries a walking telephone booth now with us. Yep. <laughs> and we'll, you know, we're looking for office space with you and our question was not telephone jacks, it was what's my what's my internet speed? You know, right. who's my provider? And that that can make or break a commercial business or a commercial real estate company now. Well, as you know, we just have, uh, in the last stages of a process of wiring all of our buildings so that a tenant like yourself can use any internet provider you want. Mm -hmm. And of course the internet age here and with all of the different providers, it's just wonderful. You've got instant worldwide communication. So John, I look at, uh, I look at all business as kind of a poker hand. I think that's always a good way to relate to it. You know, there's chips in play and there's chips out of play. When they're, when they're sitting in front of you, they're in their, your bank account. But when you're, when you're in the game, they're in the middle. And uh, so, you know, no offense, you've been around for several decades. But when are you pulling them off the table? Um, the balance sheet looks great, but like, when do you when do you actually cash out? Does that happen? Well, that's what's uh, the exit look like? What's the exit look like? I'm probably one of those people. I I just don't foresee myself hanging it up totally. I I, I need to have a purpose in life. That just keeps me going. The excitement to get up and have a new challenge. So uh, never do that. But. There's some areas I want to shift gears and why not. I want to enjoy a little bit more of the fruits of my labor. I'm, I'm almost a 27 or 24/7 worker. You know, you find me down here Sunday morning and, <laughs> or late at night, and uh, so I, I do what I need to do. But I also like to travel. For example, that's that's gives me a peace of mind. Plus, I can see what's going on in the world. And I just mm -hmm. finished a three-week tour from Singapore to uh, Doha in the oh. Middle East, and. Just seeing the fascination of those skyscrapers and seeing what the world is like. I get to Europe a lot. I go to China many times and mm -hmm. just learn what's going on out there. It's a big world. So people probably come to you for advice and you know, oh, wise one, tell me what to do. What do you um, what do you have for advice for a budding entrepreneur or someone who wants to take that next step into even the way you started? Yeah. Well, a lot of times I, I repeat that saying from my father of define your passion, mm -hmm. you know, utilize your God-given talents, and just and now I'll add the word grit. Use that grit and stick to it. And if you do that, you really work hard using that, I really think a person can be successful. Now the difficulty is, as we've discussed, it's difficult for some people at some point to continue doing it. And you just have to have that drive, that tenacity, that you really believe in yourself, you believe in what you're developing, product, service, whatever, and stick to it. I, I, think, I think you can be successful. Awesome. I think it's time for last call. All right, all right, last call. Make sure you tip your bartenders on the way out, finish them up, you gotta go. <laughs> so last call is our quick fire questions. We actually got a couple for you. So we figured we'd both rent from you, we'd, uh, oh, we'd, okay. we'd hit you from a couple of different angles. All right. But You're we'll, my clients, we'll, I call we'll, you, <laughs> not tenants, clients. We're clients, I'm gonna adopt that. We're okay. on the same side of the boat here, <laughs> yes, the table, that's yes. why it's curved. <laughs> Okay, we'll start, we'll start small here. Um, what was your first job? My first job, uh, I was a newspaper carrier for five years. I even won a trip to Europe, my first time to travel okay, abroad. Oh, your first travel. Yeah, I was, yep. Nice. Uh, favorite country ever visited? Tonga in the South Pacific. It's an island group, a Polynesian island. Beautiful? What, I mean, what Beautiful. Was, what was? Oh, yes, this was in the 1980s. My brother and I and uh, two others rented a boat and we bare boated it for two weeks and just went around from island to island. It was an unspoiled island paradise. Yeah, it just tales you wouldn't believe. Wow. But I like traveling everywhere and so it, I know you want a favorite, but I, I enjoy traveling. I like meeting people, seeing what's going on in the world and yeah. learn from it and then bring it back here to Lincoln. Yeah. His answer is the earth. <laughs> uh, uh, what do you love most about Lincoln? The quality of life. Coffee, tea or wine, John? Uh, wine. I should say beer, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe yeah. wine. <laughs> <laughs> Bar napkin business. We we don't have any uh, prejudices here. Okay. Um, what is the most crazy office design or office outfit that you've had to approve? I had to approve. Well, it's some entrepreneurs like yourself, yeah. Allie. I mean, well, requesting the, swings in the well, ceiling, astroturf well, on the ground. Well, yeah. not quite there, but you know, maybe some wild colors and there's some very creative things that fit together. Mm -hmm. You know, 
with yourself. We had Forge Light. Three Pillars has a really neat spot. Mm -hmm. uh, it just make it, what Matt did here in uh, the Tavern on the Square, or the other room. Now, the other room is probably the tops. You walk in there, and it's like going through that jail door. You're in another world. Yeah. And it's fun. You just transport in time and have an hour or two with great beverages. Just neat. I'm proud of the fact what we have done um, over these 35 years is we've just gone on a constant level. We haven't jacked things up like some of the newer projects. Uh, we, we take the risk factor out of it for you as tenants by paying the building taxes, the building insurance, all the maintenance. You see I've added a person on the uh, maintenance staff because that's very important. Mm -hmm. We want you to feel good about coming to work, that you're in a spot that is good. And then also the, the climate down here, the atmosphere for your employees and staff to make it a fun place. You'll sit out there in the courtyard and just visit and you know, we've got the improved Wi-Fi and just make an experience. You know, and that's one of the things. We can talk about finances. I know that's important. Mm -hmm. Cost is important. I, I, I look at things with prospective tenants. I think define your function first. What do you need to operate? Mm -hmm. right. uh, look at the atmosphere and then there's cost in there. And so sometimes uh, you've got to blend that and see what works best but what's an experience? Oh, I just want to tell you, I think I'd really just like to let your viewers know that there are opportunities out there. That second speech my father gave me, I had a wise man, he died when I was 19, but the second speech was he, re, he recounted, recounted his efforts in World War II. He fought for four and a half years in the armpits of the world in the South Pacific, mm -hmm. Borneo with flying snakes and all. And, wow. and he said, but the reason he did it and the fathers and other parents of our peers did it was to ensure our country continues to stand for opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's why I've, I've been serving on city council too. I wanna see that for people that we create that opportunity here in Lincoln. And it's not, a, and that the other thing my father said was, it's an opportunity, but and I, I would like to leave this with your viewers. It's an opportunity, it's not a guaranteed success. Yeah. And I think there's a, a little bit more of a prevalent uh, thought today that boy I'm guaranteed I a success it. I, I deserve it and it, I'm entitled and it doesn't quite work that way and the the upper limits are boundless they're up they're boundless with the opportunities we have here and the good fortunes I see it in other countries and the, the poverty stricken areas they may have fancy buildings but there's a huge class difference but here in Lincoln Nebraska and in the United States we have an opportunity so harness your God-given talents follow your passions, take that opportunity, and if you do that, you will be successful. But it's not a guaranteed success. And if you happen to have a setback, hey, renew with vigor, grit. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the interview with John Camp. Please look for us on iTunes Podcast Store. If you have an iPhone, there's a purple thing that says podcast. You click on that, search Bar Napkin Business, you will get the full episode. If you have ideas for guests, you can email us at show at barnapkinbusiness.co. You can also find out more about the show at barnapkinbusiness.co. So until next time, again, find us on iTunes or YouTube or join us on Facebook and Instagram. We'll see you later. Something good. <laughs> Coming your way. Something good. Uh, <laughs> iTunes podcast, YouTube. I hope you enjoyed. Enjoyed? You were killing Did I spike it? <laughs> yes. Did I spike it? We're sorry for your eardrums. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs>